So my name is Edgar Fabian Frias. I am a first generation child of undocumented immigrants who grew up in Southern California. But I've also lived in a lot of different spaces. Um, I'm someone who wears many hats. I'm a therapist, I'm an educator, I'm a healer, I'm a musician, I'm an artist, performer. So I do a lot of different things and I feel like this project is really bringing a lot of those things together. The name of this project is Give Us Home Spider, and it is essentially five social practice-based rituals that also are connected to my own indigenous ancestry. And I'm attempting to honor their legacy and their current resistance and sacred work by, in a sense, replicating their own journey to Uirikuta, which is sacred land where peyote grows and where life started. And so my own desire is to take this sacred journey that happens in Mexico and place it onto sites of both environmental destruction, but also the movements of consumer goods um, here in Southern California. And all these sites start and begin at um, San Pedro in the port of Los Angeles, which is right next to Angels Gate Cultural Center. And so all these other four sites are all connected through the, the massive highways and pathways and semi-trucks and warehouses that move all these shipments of imports and essentially are affecting all these mostly communities of color. Um, and you know, I'm working with a policy advisor and environmental justice advocate named Demi Espinosa. And she's helped me pick the five sites based on her own research in the work that she does and these sites are specifically connected to large communities, mostly Latino, Latina communities of color that are also low income and are also outside of Los Angeles, a lot of them. But essentially these communities don't have any say in the types of industries that are being built even to this day around them. And I see a big part of this project is like illuminating and bringing to light some of these practices and the consequences of these types of industries. My name is Martabelle Wasserman. I'm the curator at Angels Gate Cultural Center. Coastal Border is envisioned to be a series of social practice, performance-based projects that engage the surrounding community of the Port of Los Angeles, Port of Long Beach. Um, and the reason why it was important conceptually to do performance is because when these big kind of retrospectives happen, they're often elevating um, individuals into this place in, in, a, in the canon or in art history. And while that's really important because those histories are very usable, and, and we saw that with the last PST, as well where um, you know the Otis show about the women's building led to the emergence of the Women's Center of Creative Work so that the archive is very alive but on the other hand we wanted to show how how things are lived and felt and embodied in the present um, and that kind of resists monumentalizing the past uh, and and by being ephemeral um, is about is about the social experience and that seemed an important part of the conversation of the overall PST LA LA programming. My name is Sergio Julio Torres Barrera and about myself um, I was born in Ensenada, Baja California, to Mixtec people of Oaxaca who were on their way towards California for work. And now I am an artisan and I've also recently picked up a seasonal job at Amazon. As of right now, I've worked there for two weeks, and this is my third time back. Um, the first time I got laid off because the season was over, Christmas season was over, 
The second time I left because I just didn't want to be there. <laughs> it got too long, too real. And then now I could use the extra money to save and invest in other things. Um, yeah. yeah Give us some spider. Um, is looking at the impact of the Port of Los Angeles on communities uh, through the Inland Empire. So what we're really seeing is that like this location, the Port of Los Angeles, this site of extreme po uh, concentrated power uh, is affecting the lives materially of people all across Southern California and globally. We can really look at tr the impact of trade and production uh, on, on a much wider scale. Uh, like artists like Alan Sekula have done, um, but Give Us Home Spider does that in a very local and personal way where we're seeing um, the, the impact of these big ideas like capitalism on like specific bodies in specific places and Connecting that to other struggles that are happening, um, indigenous movements all over the world trying to reclaim land usage from corporations and making this connection between what is happening in Mexico with mining and what is happening in, in our backyard with the impacts of, of, of trade. Is, a, is really important. I think what the rituals allow us to do is connect to a, d a deeper sense of time beyond the infrastructure that we currently live with um, and connect with other possibilities for how to use land, how to use resources, and how to think of bodies and what, how, yeah, how to think about how we use land and our bodies is a really big question and it's so clear that we're doing so many things to hurt ourselves and by picking specific sites of power it it brings it from this a general critique of these systems something very specific and, and local so we're not just talking about colonialism we're going to the uh, Juan Cabrillo monument and looking at how his legacy is represented and how there's an absence of representation of Tongva history in this area. And then we go to the, the refineries and, you know, into the Inland Empire to these specific places like the, the warehouse um, where the actual goods that constitute global capital are being sorted by people and robots. And that makes it really different, a different experience when you click to, you know, order your Amazon Prime package. Which is not to say I think it's important that, like, uh, as individuals, our consumer choices aren't what's going to change the systems we live in. It's going to require a really deep rethinking of our, of our values. Um, it's not just recycling your cup. It's so beyond that. And I think these rituals kind of give us a space to connect to that and those possibilities. Yeah. So this project is a part of um, Angel Gates group exhibition called Coastal Border. And Coastal Border is one of over like 70 or 80 different shows happening all over Southern California as part of Pacific Standard Time. And so this exhibition, once it's finished, once the rituals are finished, documentation of them is going to end up in a documentary that's going to be installed at Angel's Gate. And I'm creating, with, with the help of you and the help of other people, a, essentially it's going to be a large altar that's going to represent all the sites. And this altar is going to go on the first floor at Angel's Gate. And I'm, I'm including ephemera from the rituals, I'm including images, documentation, and also um, information about the sites and about the Wirarica, because I think that's all really important to like build those bridges between the sites and also what's happening in Mexico. Because the Wirarica in Mexico are actually, to this day, challenging quarries that are trying to build 
big factories in sacred land. And they're doing it through ritual, through protest, through also bringing to light this information. And so I see this as kind of building a direct bridge. And oddly enough, you know, I was affected by a quarry in my hometown. And so I'm really seeing that as like a special link um, because a lot of this work has to do with crystals too, because crystals play a big part in Wirarika um, spirituality. And I was also led to this project by a crystal. And so um, crystals usually come from quarries. And so there's definitely like a link here. And I'm, I'm making a lot of ojos de Dios, and the ojos de Dios are like a portal. And you're creating a portal, and a portal is also like a mirror. And mirrors are used to kind of create pathways, to show things that have not been shown, and to also create linkages. As we are working with spider magic energy, we're creating these webs through these different portals. And that's how I'm envisioning it, by connecting all these sites. I'm just making a web and making portals that will all end up at Angel's Gate in San Pedro. Ancestors land, our bodies, 
drain. I mean by tears. Center, spirit, void. Josh. I'm working at Angel Gate Cultural Center through the Getty. Uh, the Getty has a program called the Getty Multicultural Undergraduate Internship and through that I was able to get an internship through Angel's Gate. Um, I'm working, that's a 10-week program and the Getty sponsors it and it's like a grant. It's a really great program. Um, so is there like any specific categories or? Yeah, the, each each institution. So they sponsor like sixty institu institutions, um, and they all are different. So the one that I got was a cur curatorial internship. Mm. So I'm working with, under Marta Bell Wasserman, who's a curator at Angels Gate. Right. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I just graduated from Cal State Long Beach with a drawing and painting BFA. So. I think my work is mostly or primarily like painting and drawing or drawing and painting and I definitely do like a little bit of everything so sculpture and performance. Yeah, and I think it's important to kind of mention what we were talking about earlier in terms of co collaboration of, you know, there's this idea or people have this idea that as an artist you kind of create this thing and you're like praised for making this thing when 
you've had like assistants and like you know people are creating this, these objects that you didn't really have a hand in, but it's kind of like your idea. And I think what you're doing is different because it's about um, it's about like what you said, like connections and relationships, and because we're all living in the same space and you're activating that space through the, the ritual. So right. Uh, yeah. And I even see that connected to the, the name of the project, Give Us Home Spider. Spider Web is about connection. It's about making these like networks in a sense. And I think that's also part of like needing to honor that is because I'm working with that energy. And also, as you've seen, my desire, my intention behind these rituals is to really connect beyond time and space to the land, to the ancestors, to the people that have been there. Um, knowing that now they've been colonized and that they're, you know, as we've seen in, in a lot of these sites, the, the actual nature has been destroyed. And so that's a way of me almost like grieving and honoring those beings also. So that's like another connection there, right? That they're also part of that. And I definitely feel like a big inspiration for this project comes from my work with Obsidian and working with ancestors that have come through and told me and given me images and movements and rituals that they've told me to do and a big part of the reason why I'm doing this is because that's opened up a pathway to my own ancestry and so I definitely feel like I'm being told in a sense so it's not even me right, right. <laughs> it is me but yeah, it's, it's not like, me in a way like these, these things are kind of working through you in, in terms of like trying to communicate something yeah I think that the piece or the, the performance Like I said before, I, th I, th I think the piece was really about becoming aware of the space. It's a public space, but it felt very tense because it felt like, even though we weren't doing anything illegal, there was like some kind of all eyes on us kind of thing, like bringing attention to a thing. And that was kind of like the tense part. And right. then I think after like putting the veil on the statue and activating the statue and going to the beach, that was a very more ritualistic, and very uh, kind of almost a religious experience, kind of like like a grateful experience, like saying thank you or something mm -hmm. like that. I think that's what I felt. Things they talk about is that the mirror, you know, holding a mirror up to the world is a way of being able to see maybe parts of yourself or parts of the world that we don't want to see, and it's painful and difficult to do that and it could but what it promises is death or transformation mm. and change and so I see that a big part of this project is that energy of let's look at these sites of environmental destruction of oppression of exploitation and let's honor them let's bring them in and they're also they're things that I don't want to look at you know and, it, and it's also talking about the way that just capitalism and greed and pred predatory predation, like those energies have also created a certain way of living. And I think this project is also about like looking at that and bringing it in, um, while at the same time looking at the ways that spiritual practices have been outcast from the system. And I think that's a big part too. You mentioned myself, like I've been really looking for a sense of identity when it comes to um, a sense of identity you know, when it comes to like who I am and what my role is in society and I've always felt this big disconnect between wanting to do ritual, wanting to be kind of put into this position as a healer, as a shaman, while knowing that we live in a society that doesn't even make room for that. And so how do I kind of navigate that tension? And I think that tension is a big word in a lot of my practice. Yeah because I kind of live in between worlds or move in between spaces and stretch them out. And I think that's a big, it's important for my work too. Yes, I'm hoping that people spend time with the installation because I'm almost seeing it as like a narrative that's going to be like splattered everywhere. Um, and so people, it's almost like a story, but it's not going to be linear and it's not going to be in order. So you're going to have to maybe like explore. So I, I really hope people stay curious and open. And I also hope it brings up confusion, maybe maybe even anger. I hope I do hope it like moves something. That's my goal. And I also see this as spell work. And so spell work is pl about planting seeds and setting intentions. 
And so um, that's one of the reasons I'm working with Demi Espinosa. She's really interested in like bringing some of these messages to the public and having them act on these messages. Because a lot of people don't know about all the ways that we're being attacked almost by these industries. And so that I also want to illuminate that and, and bring that to people's attention to create a little bit of like, I guess like a catalyst or energy behind that too. So that people will go home and be like, oh, let me question that warehouse that's being built near my home, right? Let me think about what does that mean for me health-wise? What does it mean for the environment? Instead of it just being seen as normal, like, oh, this is progress, so... Yeah, like even for example, like next week, next Thursday, I'm going to my old hometown because they're building two warehouses, one next to my high school and one next to my elementary school. And I found out about this through my friend Demi here in Los Angeles and my family that lives like less than half a mile from there had no idea. And so that just kind of shows you how, you know, you can be living somewhere and there can be a big construction happening that's going to affect you and your children and their children but no one will ever tell you about that. You have to find out about these things. And similarly, the fifth ritual is at a site of environmental destruction that was releasing tons of hexavalent chromium. And I breathed those in when I was growing up, but I never knew about it until one day, because of a research project, I found out about it. And so I would have never known had I not accidentally found out about it. Right. There, it's like 90% speaking like mm -hmm. my parents had no idea about this like here they had no idea that this was happening they and only found out because income, of and they they try to pretend oh it's jobs coming into the community but they're seasonal they are low-wage jobs they're affecting the health of the workers themselves right <clears throat> And I am currently working on a research project based on some information that I found out where, where when I was growing up there was tons of toxic chemicals being released near my home in Bloomington and that was never really told to the public and that research kind of got me interested in learning more about the ways that corporations can sometimes lie and hide information in order to turn a quick profit and so I found out about these warehouses very recently and actually came here I don't no longer live in this neighborhood but I'm still very connected to this area and so I am incredibly concerned about these warehouses being built near schools 
um, especially with what we know about the toxin, um, the way that these warehouses destroy environments and also the way that these semi-trucks destroy respiratory quality. And the toxic chemicals that were released years ago in 2008, it was found out. Um, they destroyed and also hurt a lot of people's respiratory systems, including my own. And so I just want it to be known that it's happened before and it's happening again. Thank you. To improve safety for children, it is absolutely critical that we prioritize schools as key destinations and children as vulnerable users. So in addition to safe routes, I'm also concerned about the environmental degradation that is happening in our community. Like the speakers before, that children walk to and from school, play in schoolyards, must breathe in poor air quality. And with the increasing warehouses throughout our county, enough is enough. We do not support projects that jeopardize the traffic safety or environmental safety of our community. So I urge you to consider a vote to adopt a resolution to prevent more development of warehouses near schools. And this is one of the minimum things we can do to move forward to bring these issues to light and to acknowledge that warehouses are a problem for our community. They're not job stimulators, they're killers to our environment. Thank you. And this is Demi, I feel, yeah. in a way, too. It's so good. Yeah. 
there for about 20, 25 years um, and I currently work as a policy manager on active transportation issues. Um, we monitor transportation policy and it, because we work in Riverside County and San Bernardino County, I'm interested in environmental justice issues and having grown up in the area, I find myself wanting to be a champion for that, um, for 
the experiences that I have had. Uh, doing like performance in public space and ritual in public space really requires kind of having a foot in two worlds, a foot in and trying to hold space in a very practical way because we're on government land or private property or, and, and we're making these gestures that critique how, uh, critique power and um, power is constantly monitoring that and we see that, we saw that and felt that at the refinery when we were followed out and um, very clearly under surveillance and that kind of, for me, made me feel like a between two worlds, really trying to like protect ourselves and hold space and get into this idea of connecting with the land in a deeper way. And similarly at Cabrillo Beach, it was about, you know, really being mindful of how people were using the park, what the police were doing, what other people were doing around us um, to try to like make these gestures, but also go beyond the gesture to connect spiritually and politically and emotionally to these ideas of kind of undoing these histories or rewriting them, reweaving them, not rewriting, but embodying alternative narratives. And I think that's mm -hmm. what we saw and experienced at Cabrillo Beach. It's not like we are by like engaging with that monument, we're not trying to rewrite history or erase, erase colonial violence. The idea is to like present alternative uh, narratives, which there are many. Um, and many that we also don't have access to because they're not written in the same way. So ritual kind of opens up a space to try to imagine and connect with those um, histories that aren't, aren't monumentalized. And, um, you know, and, and it, it kind of has to be ephemeral to, in order to do that in a way. Um, but it's the repetition of these things that can, can create or undo structures, I think, if, if we imagine it in connection with all these other movements. Um, I, I, seeing the refinery, seeing uh, the coastline so brutalized by industry uh, and seeing gas, uh, oil just being like sucked up from the ground is always a devastating feeling even when it's very quotidian. Uh, it definitely has an impact um, and there's a lot of sadness in seeing how the land has been damaged and exploited and how bodies are exploited in order to do that. Um, and. You know, I think with ritual, it allows kind of an emotional space for that. And, and then there's this other work of how do you continue that? How do you move beyond the kind of collective spiritual experience to the political work? But I do think identifying these sites and seeing how these concepts are, are in the landscape is a really important step. The project has been um, acting uh, as an advisor for Edgar, and I've known Edgar for about 12 years. We've been really close friends. Um, we've, like I said, we've both grown up in the Inland Empire. Um, and my role has been uh, securing and identifying um, these em environmental justice sites through my, because of my work and because of my interest in it. So you know, we chose uh, Bloomington, Coachella Valley, Moreno Valley and all of these areas are experiencing environmental degradation as a result of freight truck industries. Um, so it's the communities, the low-income communities, communities of color who live along freeways or corridors that are essential for these goods movements, trucks to take along the goods to warehouses. So I really love this project because of the connection that it brings to consumerism, um, highlighting uh, issues with capitalism in our area.
Central Place because I don't see any activity. The building behind us, 511. So, yeah. Or is that a broom? That's Let a me get her out of the box. Oh my gosh, I love it! Oh!
that was just performed was near my current place, warehouse in Orna Valley. And what I got from it was a connection to the land that still is and was. And my contribution to the performance and the ritual was to go beyond my own self and acknowledge just my physical working body as a worker, to acknowledge that, to acknowledge the time work the machinery. I've made a web structure out of branches, uh, which are basically two crosses, and I've tied them together with rope. And then with a thinner rope, I've kind of made a webbing, a spiraling web, to basically just create a giant web that's probably six feet by six feet. And then I've made a neorica, mm -hmm. um, which is an offering, or it's an object that you make that you offer to a site. And I think uh, that one is going to go in, into the final installation at Angel's Gate. And you've made smaller ones that you you have put in the previous performances and the one that you're going to perform at. So these are just offerings that you've done. So I've made those two things. Right. And then, um, yeah. The sticks are from this garden. And um, 
outside your studio you have an avocado tree and it looks like it's dying because um, there's a lot of like dead branches so I'm pretty sure those are the falling off and I basically created it from that. Right. But through that ritual for myself I learned to not resent anything and to accept rhythm, pattern, and to see myself as a bigger part, as part and beyond part of my job, that physical place. But, um, and imbue my soul in there to say I am still people permeating through the land like animals and like wind. Yes. Mm. I feel. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Yes, I <laughs> Um, so the research I've done is primarily in the Inland Empire, Inland Valleys, um, around how the goods movement industry has been overwhelmingly been the sole perpetrator of a lot of environmental degradation in the area. Um, so I was really concerned about the community's impact from these freight trucks, our exposure to emissions like particle matter, um, and I wanted to kind of explore this rhetoric that the goods movement brings jobs in our area, secure jobs that are actually temporary and seasonal and low wage. And so they're actually hurting our communities. And I wanted to also explore this idea of how the industry is very unregulated. And I wanted to use some of our um, relationships that I use for my work. I think it's really important that Edgar is working with someone who does the kind of more practical work of community organizing around environmental racism, um, which, which practical is not a value judgment, it's just like Demi is doing the, the work of understanding kind of statistically uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of um, testimony what the impacts of these systems are and while we can like feel them and imagine other possibilities um, it's important to ground that in what's going on and how grassroots struggle is happening on the ground and Demi kind of is the link into into that present tense work that we need for our future. But I think what ritual does is it kind of, it gives us a healing space and an emotional space to kind of cope with those realities and facts and loss um, in, order to do, in order to go forward and keep doing the work and go, going to, to power in all of these different ways. Um, through existing channels and through channels that we need to make. And what I'm hoping that um, this pro project brings awareness to is environmental justice issues, but particularly environmental racism. It is no coincidence that the communities that are facing the majority of this environmental degradation is communities of color, low-income communities. Um, it's important to understand the historical context under which our cities were planned and they were planned so that low-income people can afford uh, housing that is closest to warehouses, is closest to freeways. Um, and so if this project does one thing, I hope that it identifies the experiences that environmental justice communities are, are enduring. We bring voice to that um, and that you know, we help so support the leadership from the community who is facing that daily. And, you know, I, I really want to continue to work with them to provide public testimony, um, change policies that better reflect um, 
their health and better reflect how we can all thrive. Alabanzas a la diosa Santa Ex.
X, 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 Dios X, Santex, 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 Dios X, I'm 
thank you, West. Take this message to the West. Turning south. We thank you, South, for being here with us. Fire, will, courage, serpents. We thank you for being here with us today. Take this message to the South. So, hi, my name is Estela Sanchez and um, I grew up in the Coachella Valley and I've lived in Southern California all my life. Um, I feel really connected to the desert land and um, as of lately, I've come into what I would describe as a spiritual awakening um, and as an artist, that has influenced a lot of the work that I do now. Um, and so I identify as a curandex, so a healer, or X indicating that it, it's gender neutrality. And, um, and once I began identifying as that, I, I, I would say I started my healing journey. And so I've started to think, of, think critically about in particular through through my art practice what it means to heal um, and what it means for me to heal and so in order to know how to heal I've had to look at how I have what I need to heal from um, and so when I say I when I say I it's like oh it's so indiv individualistic me 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 but I've been in but I but I feel like I'm one of many um, so, like, myself is connected to communities and communities that have undergone the same traumas that I've gone through, like, whether colonial, um, like, or even, like, post-colonial, like, academic words, what does that mean? You know, like, like, living in, uh, living, like, like, living in the, growing up in the Coachella Valley or growing up in, like, in a legacy, from a legacy of farm workers, um, Who've, for, who've experienced first how both, like, both like the trauma that has been influenced on the earth and who are like residuals of that trauma too. Um, and so it, uh, I participated in uh, Edgar's um, performance piece as an extension of my, of like my art, my my healing slash art practice, which I don't really distinguish between. Um, and in it, I was embodying a divine mirror. So with the concept of a divine mirror, or just a, a mirror in itself, like a mirror is something that you hold up to see what's real, to, to see a reflection. And in that reflection, um, What is what I pick up, or whoever looks into the mirror, whatever they see is it connects them to their to like a to their higher self, or to a truth that hides a truth that's hidden behind um, a lot of uh, a truth that's hidden behind layers and layers and layers of. Um, of misguided truths, because I guess nothing's a lie. In the, uh, in the presence of the Divine Mirror and their performance uh, was a way to flip the body inside out so the environment becomes the body and like the flesh that we associate with the body becomes the mirror to reflect back, uh, to reflect back the environment. To hold, and so in that way it holds space for the environment to reflect to, th to think and um, evaluate and 
and I, I, I guess reflect back on the things that it's experienced, the things that have harmed it, the, the people that have harmed it, but also the things and the people that have like touched its soils, and graced its soils, and brought love and life to its soils.